Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at another recently published book. This is The Schmeisser Myth by Martin Hellebrandt, and published by Collector Grade Publications. Now if you have really any firearms reference library at all, I'm sure you will recognize Collector Grade as one of the premier publishers of technical firearms reference books. And this is no different. Um, I will admit I am biased such that the moment I hear about a new collector grade book being published, I'll go buy it because they have a track record of doing really excellent work. And just based on that, I'll buy anything that they publish. However, it's nice to actually take a look through one and be able to see what is in this new book. Now, when I first heard about this, or when I first saw it advertised, uh, my first thought was, oh, cool, Collector Grade's doing a book on the MP40. And, you know, probably the MP38 and MP40, and the, you know, how the two developed from each other. And it sort of is, but this book is actually quite a lot more than that. This is, in fact, the subtitle says, German Submachine Gun Through Two World Wars. And that really is the case with this book. It's not the MP38 and 40 specifically. It is starting with the MP18, and in fact, starting with the first submachine guns used in World War I, the Villa Perosa, really, um, German development of this concept all the way through the end of World War II. So yes, the primary focus is on the MP38 and the MP40, but the first third of the book covers a lot of developmental guns that came first. And this is an area where there's not very good documentation. There's not much else out there to reference. There are some books on submachine guns, but one of the problems you get into is in the 1930s there was just this profusion of small production German or sort of German submachine guns, and they're MP32s and 34s and 35s kind of out the wazoo. There's lots of them. Couple different of this, couple different 34s, there's the EMP. What's that one? Well, who knows? There's Vollmer, there's Schmeisser, there's Hainel. What are there's not a lot of good information that, that makes it clear what are the similarities, what are the differences, and how did these guns all relate to each other. That is what Hellebrandt does a really good job of in this particular book. So he starts with the MP18 and discusses some things like, what's the deal with it being marked the MP18, I? And then the MP28, II? Well, there there's some theories put forth in the book. There's some discussion of a small number of guns that are actually known that are marked uh, with the MP18 IV in an interesting little, just a niche subject, but it's one of those questions that comes up. Like, well, okay, this isn't something that we see in any other German submachine gun uh, nomenclature, so what is that? Well, they talk about that in here, and then they're going to talk about the, the development between different manufacturers and different designers, and who came up with what elements and how those elements evolved in different guns. So a lot of this is going to focus around topics like how the German military was kind of trying to be sneaky in developing submachine guns while they were prohibited from doing so under uh, during the Weimar Republic, under the Treaty of Versailles. So in that way, that's where some of this obfuscation comes from. For example, Steyr and Solothurn working together, Rheinmetall working in Switzerland. A lot of German companies kind of tried to push their development so that it looked like it was off not offshore, but uh, over the borders in some other country, and thus not German, when in reality, it, there's a lot of, really, if you want the whole story, that's what the book is for. It's more than I can explain in just a simple review video here. Um, after we get through some of that, they do turn to the specific development, the trials that lead to the MP38 and then the MP40. Of course, a uh, substantial amount on the difference between those two, the development process from the MP38 to the MP40. Uh, there is, as the title suggests, there is some description here of why this gun became known as the Schmeisser in the first place, because in fact, Schmeisser did not design the MP40. The MP40 was kind of designed by a committee, um, a group of technicians at the Irma factory and a group of uh, German trials officers looking at some of the shortcomings of the trials guns in the 1930s, together with the designers at Irma. There is no single real designer who can be credited with the MP38. Uh, and certainly not Schmeisser, who really had very little to do with it. Um, he would go on to develop the MP41, which is a true Schmeisser machine pistol, uh, but that has some differences from the MP40, and that's another element that's discussed here, as well as 
who the MP41 was actually made for, because none of the ones that are out there are actually waffen -omped, but there's like 25,000 of them that were made, so what's the deal with that? Also discussed in here. This is an area where you'll see like a manufacturer's name on a gun being mistaken for the actual designer. For example, um, German heavy machine guns being called Spandaus because they were manufactured by Spandau. Well, in reality, Spandau was one of many manufacturing plants and the gun's design really had nothing to do with Spandau. You see the same thing with Schmeisser. Uh, there's one British report that comes out. In fact, it's one of the very first reports on the gun. So it's taken as a primary source for many, many years. And it calls it a paratroop machine pistol or a paratroop carbine Schmeisser type. And that name sticks, despite the fact that Schmeisser has nothing to do with the gun. So that's discussed in here um, where it started and how far it, it kind of uh, promulgated. And then, of course, there's a nice balance of the, the history and development of the gun and also the technical collector details. So chapters towards the end of the book will cover things like um, MP40 markings, the different, like the five main variants of MP40 that there were. Let's be clear, these are all very similar. They're more like manufacturing tweaks than true uh, different versions of the gun. Um, but covers the, the version, the varieties of the gun, uh, the many different varieties of magazine, the different markings, the different companies that made them, and there were some substantial developments of the magazines through production. Um, of course, the magazine, it's a single feed, double stack magazine, which means you've got two rows of cartridges being compressed into just one. And that was by far the biggest weakness of the MP40. Uh, that magazine was not particularly reliable. The, the British would copy it for the Sten, and that's also discussed in here. And they would keep that single stack magazine or single feed magazine, which would go on to be the biggest Achilles heel of the Sten gun as well. So there's discussion of why did they do that? Um, as early as 1917, uh, the Mauser company was using double feed, double stack magazines uh, for their, their C96 trench carbine conversions. And, and so why didn't they use that magazine? Well, they'll talk about that in here, as well as what they did to ameliorate some of the problems with that single feed magazine by redesigning the feed geometry a bit. Um, for the technically minded, that's some really interesting technical information in there. And then, of course, also the markings on the magazines, the different manufacturers, the different Waffenamp inspectors, all that sort of material. And then other ancillary things like uh, magazine pouches, the slings, the safety devices, uh, the ammunition that was used. Uh, Post-war use of the MP40, there were countries like Norway that would go on to use the MP40 in standard mainline military service for many years after World War II. And that's covered in here as well. So all in all, it's a really cool book covering a lot of material that's not very well covered anywhere else. Um, for me, honestly, for me, it's the, the first half of the book where it's really talking about the development of the submachine guns overall, the tactical, the development of the tactical doctrine of the submachine gun in World War I, and then how the guns themselves change up to the MP38. That's the most interesting part of this for me. Uh, but of course, there are lots of people out there very much interested in the MP40, uh, the iconic German submachine gun of World War II, and this has a great amount of information on that as well. So if this is something that you are uh, been searching for, something you think you're interested in, check it out at Collector Grade Publications. There's a link in the description below. Um, I expect it's available elsewhere as well, um, but Collector Grade is kind of the easiest place to get it from. Um, it is brand new in print, just been out a couple months now, I believe, um, as of the posting of this video. So it should be around for a while. But of course, uh, one never wants to forget the, the, like the one third of the collector grade catalog that is permanently out of print and goes way up in price. So if you're interested in it, you know what? Pick it up now while it's on your mind and while it's readily available at list price. And uh, then in 10 years, you'll be one of those lucky people who actually has a copy before they all disappeared. Thanks for watching. Tune in again next week to ForgottenWeapons.com for some more technical firearms book reviews.